Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, and welcome um, again. The, um, this event is sponsored by the Coalition for Education and Outreach, otherwise known as CEO. Um, CEO is a community of practice that brings together science educators, education and outreach practitioners, and education researchers who work at Berkeley, but also those who work in off-campus organizations such as science centers, schools, museums, colleges, and universities, mostly in the Bay Area, but also in other states uh, as well. We've grown quite, quite a lot in the last uh, three or four years. So, um, and in case I didn't say it, my name is Kate Spore. I co-chair CEO, along with Lale, who you just heard from. Um, and today we're pleased to bring you a panel of five STEM majors. Thank you to them, um, who will, and, and Lolly will introduce them, but they'll give you their perspectives on academic life during the past year. I think very often we've, we've, we've um, uh, resorted to data and to um, research and not to the actual voices of people who have experienced this phenomenal and in many ways, um, I don't know, um, un well, certainly unprecedented year. Um, and today you get a chance to, to hear from them. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Lale. Thanks, Kate. I just knew you were gonna say the word unprecedented. I know. I, I can see you searching for another I, word. I, but... I'm sorry, it's such a cliche, oh, no, but how <laughs> else? I was gonna say this, this atomic bomb of a year, but <laughs> <laughs> I decided to be more positive. That sounds good. Well, uh, thanks so much for that nice introduction. Um, again, uh, Kate and I just want to welcome all of you. Thanks so much for joining us for our um, discussion today. Um, so our event today um, is uh, Life During COVID Perspectives from STEM Majors at UC Berkeley. Um, as, it, as we uh, talked about earlier, um, you know, uh, you've all uh, you've all pre-registered, so you probably have this information. But we are going to be running from uh, 12 to 1:30, so we will end um, by 1:30 Pacific Standard Time. I know we may have uh, folks from other time zones. Um, Kate and I will be, besides these introductory remarks, in the background supporting um, the event monitoring the chat, making sure folks have what you need. So feel free during the event, if you have a question or need something, to reach out to either me or Kate via the chat. Um, Anthony, who I'm going to introduce in a second, is going to be um, leading our panel discussion, and I'll be supporting him there. Um, but Kate and I will be around for anything anyone needs. Um, please do keep in mind, it's always uh, nice to keep yourself muted um, when someone else is speaking. We will have an opportunity um, to take questions from the audience, and we'll be using uh, the chat to facilitate that. Um, and besides that, um, as I mentioned before, we're recording the session. We'll make it available later. Um, we're very open to your feedback and your questions, and we want this to be um, a, a great experience for everyone. Um, so, as Kate mentioned, um, you know, one of the one of the things that a lot of us who work in science education and outreach do, we're involved in data collection. We're reading reports. We're sharing information with each other, and really trying to figure out what to do during this unique time. And so, what we really wanted to do is give a platform to students at UC Berkeley across multiple departments um, in order for them to be able to share the way that um, COVID-19 and the crisis has impacted them, how learning from a distance has impacted them. And we know the experiences can be really different from person to person. So we don't want to speak for people, but instead with them. Um, and I'm so pleased to introduce you um, to Anthony Garcia. Anthony, can you give us a little wave so we can see you? Um, Anthony is a first year doctoral student um, in the chemistry department. Um, and I know that starting the first year of grad school or being an undergrad is definitely a unique experience. So I really appreciate you being here. And thanks for being my co-collaborator on brainstorming um, about the topics that we'll be speaking about today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And um, yeah, I'm excited to uh, get into the discussion. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lale. Uh, yeah, I'm Anthony. I'm a first year graduate student here at Berkeley. Uh, I was an instructor last semester for general chemistry, and I was also an undergraduate student last spring uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So I also had a little taste of the virtual instruction myself, um, but I'm happy to be here with you all today. And uh, I guess we can get started with our undergraduate panelists. Um, 
first, I'd like to ask all of our panelists to uh, introduce themselves, um, what major that they study, and uh, what year they are in their undergraduate uh, education. Anyone can start, go ahead <laughs> and start off. Uh, yeah, I could start, or yeah, I could start. Um, my name is Julio. Um, I'm a fourth. I'm in my last semester here at UC Berkeley, my fourth year, and I'm doing um, applied math. Mm -hmm. And my pronouns are he/him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Susana. My pronouns are she/her. I studied physics at Berkeley, but I recently graduated. Hi everyone, my name is Adriana. I'm a third year. I use the She series and I'm a psychology major and education minor. Hello, I'm Yue Yi. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I am a geology major with a minor in climate science. Uh, I am third year in school, so undergraduate junior. All right, thank you. So, now with the introductions out of the way, we can get started with our first question. Um, first, uh, as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic kind of uh, in, impacted us a lot in the previous spring. Uh, it happened kind of in the middle and everything. Uh, we had to make an adaption very quickly to remote instruction. Uh, so I wanna talk about kind of our environment during this, uh, during this transition. Um, where, could you could we have the panelists talk about where we they were living remotely uh, under remote instruction and how their housing situation impacted their experiences as a student? Yeah, I think uh, maybe we could just keep the or the same order going. Um, but I I originally um, I lived here in Berkeley in in an apartment in a two bedroom apartment, and that didn't change throughout the pandemic. Um, I thought that if I went home, I, I posed a risk to my parents who are on the older end, they're in their fifties. Um, so I thought that, um, maybe if I stayed here, even if it was a little lonely or the only place that I went out to was, uh, to get groceries, I thought that that was the best, um, for both, uh, their health and also for kind of my own, uh, to keep my own schedule, because if you're home, your parents want you to go to the grocery store with them, um, visit X, Y, Z. And that just adds on to um, kind of the academic pressure and the time constraints that we're always under. Um, so I stayed here in my apartment and luckily I have this, uh, I have a good space for myself I've, um, that I've perfected over the years and have my little routines, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess for the most part, like while I was in school, I was living in a co-op. Um, which is like kind of like an affiliated housing kind of thing. It was like an all women's co-op. Um, there weren't too many people there. Like I think total like maybe 25, but it was like a really, really large house. So everyone had their own room. Um, and the only thing that was difficult was like actually finding like a space outside of your room where there weren't too many people around. Um, so kind of really like scheduling out when you would go like cook your dinner or when you would go um, like for a walk like so that kind of like um, yeah and then I also think that for me it was somewhat isolating just because I didn't already know people um, and so I think that I didn't really have as much of an opportunity to build community um, which was fine because like I, I don't think that was necessarily the goal at the time um, and the housing prices uh, for co-ops are really really solid so that was really nice. Oof, where do I begin? <laughs> um, so I'm living with my family right now. We are a total of eight people <laughs> living in one household. And um, it has been interesting to say the least. Um, to what Julio was kind of um, mentioning, yeah, it, you play so many roles when you're with your family. Um, as a student trying to do homework, attend classes, as a daughter trying to go help your mom with dishes, cleaning up the dinner table. As an aunt, my nephew always asking like, can you play? Like, why don't you ever play with me? Um, it's just so many to, so many roles to take and it feels like there's no time for myself. Um, but yeah, and then trying to do homework, like it's really hard to dedicate time to everyone and everything. And 
um, just trying to find the balance every day. <laughs> but yeah, and also another big issue is um, since three people need Zoom, um, we have meetings like that overlap sometimes and there's not really good internet access. Um, so it's just kind of like, oh, when do you have a meeting? Um, oh, like let's switch at this time. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot to take in. Yeah, for me, I am an international student and I am originally from China. So I, uh, I wouldn't be able to go home for more than a year now. And at the beginning of the pandemic of last year's spring, um, because everybody living in my house is going home. Uh, so there's nobody to live with me in Berkeley and my parents are pretty worried about that. So uh, I went to my family friend's house in the Bay Area, um, but uh, starting fall, my friends are coming back to Berkeley to like live in our house. So I live in a house with um, four other uh, students um, and my parents feel more comfortable of me uh, returning to like the near campus area to live with uh, my friends. And yeah, so since last fall, I've been living with people who I already know before the pandemic and yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we were all kind of forced into different situations um, when the pandemic started. Even myself, uh, just like Adriana, I had to go back home. And with my family, there's a lot of additional stresses and responsibilities, um, a lot of distractions too. Makes it a little more challenging or complicated to study. But for our next question, um, here at Berkeley, we're really big on campus communities. And in terms of building or maintaining communities on campus, have you felt that under uh, this situation, if you've been able to do this? Um, if so, how? And if not, how do you feel as a student? What, could, uh, what would be helpful to feel more connected to the campus community uh, during this time? Uh, yeah, so um, the question was a little long, but I think if I understand it correctly, um, what communities do we feel like we're a part of, but also um, what communities did we kind of become a part of through, through the pandemic? Is that, am I getting that right? Okay. Um, so me, I personally feel like I have a community in the um, Caltech department, which is basically um, an undergraduate teaching department. Um, where you can get your minor and then also work towards your teaching credential. So I have a lot of buddies there. Um, we talk on the weekends, go um, lesson plan together for our teaching placements and stuff like that. So I really feel like I'm a part of that community in the sense that I feel like a teacher and they see me like a teacher. Um, so it's just kind of this uh, two way, two way thing. And communities that I, I wish I was a part of, but not really. Um, so the math community, uh, so being a math major, um, a lot of people work independently. And when you try to ask someone for help, they are a bit standoffish. Um, and it often comes off as like, basically, can you give me the answers when usually that's not the case. Um, so I wish there was a way for me to meet uh, my buddies, the, the my recent math classes, all three of them, um, were just recorded lessons that I watched on YouTube or on Google Drive. So I really had no sense of connection with my classmates and I had no uh, kind of buddies to study with. Um, so I really wish I was, uh, I really wish the school made some sort of um, interactive thing to, to, to talk with your classmates instead of have, even if you do have these classes that are not um, in, 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 you know, through Zoom, um, I wish that there was a way to speak with my classmates, uh, speak about topics, speak about whatever whatever was in my head, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I guess in terms of community, I feel like I've always kind of struggled to build community, especially in like um, physics spaces. I feel like there are a lot of people I just don't relate to. Um, but most recently, this last semester, a couple of, so I have one friend who I'm really close to in physics and like she knew someone else who she was really close to. And so we, we created a group of all women who were like doing a physics study group like once a week. 
Um, and that was really nice. We spent like half of the time complaining <laughs> and then like half of it actually doing the problem set. And it was it was a really nice like community building kind of environment. Um, but outside of that, I wasn't really interacting with too many people. And I feel like that's kind of always been true of me throughout like undergrad. Uh, personally, I feel that I have been able to find community through student organizations, but not classes. Um, for student organizations, you know, we have weekly meetings, activities, um, icebreakers. Um, so I really appreciate that. It's It's been helpful <laughs> for sure throughout the pandemic. Um, but in classes, um, everyone has their camera off or like don't want to talk. They, they hide behind the screen and I do too, I'm, I admit. Um, it's just so hard and I understand, but um, I would also appreciate like a buddy system just to have a friend, at, one friend at least in the class to kind of um, ask questions and yeah, <laughs> so a buddy system for sure. Wow, I didn't know that everyone's experience is so different. Um, so for me, um, since freshman year, I've been a part of the Cal marching band and Cal Band is like my biggest community on campus. And I actually find, well, it's like, so for contents, Cal Band has like 200 people in the entire organization. Um, and before pandemic, everybody is super close. We are like best friends with each other and I can tell you all 200 names. But since pandemic, it's kind of awkward because there's no like music rehearsals and like there's no performances. So like, I feel personally, I try to engage with more students in my organization because I really like this band and value them as my friend. But I do find it challenging to engage new students like the transfer students or the incoming freshmen um, to uh, welcome them into this community because it's, so, it's such a different experience. And uh, we as returning students is already finding it pretty hard to engage. And it is especially challenging to convey what is Cal spirit and how is the Cal community like to those new coming students. Um, but for me, I do find for classes, I am more engaged with my fellow students. Because before pandemic, I feel it probably just me, but when sitting in a classroom, it's so visual for me that I am competing with other students. Like, even though it's not really the case, like some classes, they don't curve people that hard, but I still feel the peer pressure of like, this person answered a question, that person already finished the problem set. It is so close to me. But um, during the pandemic, I am all on my own and I have more time to think for myself. And I do find that I actually need a lot of help. And in this time, I, it is actually my first time in my college experience to reach out to other people and say, hey, can we form a study group? I'm really struggling with this problem set. Um, and I do find that when I am in my house, I am more willing to speak to people because I don't know, it's like, um, because I have this need, I see them more as collaborators than co like, uh, competing with me. And yeah, that's my experience. Hey, Anthony, um, we just had a few questions that were very related to the discussion from the chat. I'm wondering if I can just ask one of those right now. Um, sure, yeah. So some folks have been sending in um, questions and a few of them relate to, um, you know, this, this idea of community building. So some of you panelists have, you know, you've all talked about, um, you know, building community and, you know, maintaining connections with a lot of your peers. That's been a lot of the focus of the discussion. And we've had a few questions from the audience in thinking about what staff people, we're gonna talk about distance learning in a second, but what staff people who work with students what they might be able to do to better support you or better make you feel a part of the community or have there been any examples of, of staff folks who have done a good job of supporting you and you could share something that worked well um, just for anyone that um, you know this question really applies. The one thing that I did see as an effort in one of my classes uh, was in a was it an electrical engineering uh, uh, upper division course where um, the classes were through Zoom, but the because the because it was such a huge classroom, um, it wasn't a Zoom meeting. It was a Zoom um, 
what's it called? More like a, like a, it's like a performance basically where you can't even type in the chat and where um, the professor had to repeat everything that was asked to him. Um, so it just felt like someone was talking at you. Yeah, a webinar. Someone was talking at you instead of talking with you. So as a way to kind of get through this, um, on top of having office hours, the TA actually set up what they called um, homework parties. So in our problem sets, say we had five, five problems where the whole problem set was 20 pages, they would devote um, they would they would they would make uh, for example an hour of a homework party. They would make that um, um, just for one problem, and this was a great way to meet students because in the homework party he would give us time to uh, go into breakout rooms, think about the problem, talk through the problem with some people, and I thought this was really valuable. I think that if it wasn't for these homework parties, I wouldn't have um, gotten the problems it's done, wouldn't have passed the class, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something that I've that I've seen done um where they create these spaces for us but don't really manage them too hard so i think that if, if they were to set up uh for example like a movie night or something um people are less likely to go to it because you are forced to be social and um it's it, it's in a way just kind of uh childish some people would think so i thought the homework praise was a great way of getting to know people while also going to content Um, something that I've thought about a lot is like the possibility of having like a discussion section specifically meant for like minoritized students um, where they would be able to kind of like work together within a discussion section um, and maybe even have a graduate student who was also like from a minoritized background. I think that that would be like a really solid way to community build and also like a very incentivized way because like it is your discussion section. So that's actually something that you're already expected to go to. If you can go to it with people who you can actually like relate to, I think that would be really nice. Susanna, are you thinking that that would be, um, that idea would be something that students would sort of self-identify and sort of select into if given the option or? Um... Yeah, definitely. I don't think you should force students into it, but I think <laughs> a lot of students would like the option. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks very much for that idea. And um, Julio, thanks for sharing about um, something that worked for you as well. Awesome. Uh, okay. Uh, we can move on to our next question. Um, so about distance learning in general, what were the main challenges you faced or are currently still facing with uh, distance learning? Let's let's start off with like say for example lectures. So the one thing that I struggled with was definitely taking in material, um, because uh, um, uh, mathematics as a major, it's not super interactive in the sense that you have professors, um, where you get thrown um, twenty different definitions in a lecture and then you have to make sense of them on your own. So the professor talks at you, he's not talking with you. Um, and in their eyes, there's one correct way to do something, which there is. Um, however, they, they're, I'm surprised that they haven't managed to figure out a way to make um, upper division mathematics more approachable and more intuitive. Um, and that to me is especially interesting because I'm interested in being a teacher and I'm interested in different um, teaching strategies. Um, and the other thing that I've struggled with is simply having a separation between home life and work life. Um, next to my desk, I have my bed, right? <laughs> my apartment isn't a mansion. Um, I turn around and I'm at my bed. Um, so to me, the hard part is days uh, blending together. Um, for example, my math classes, none of them are in person. So, I can sit in my bed at 2 a.m. and watch a lecture, right? Which sounds sad, but does happen. And to me, I just I would just like the separation of, you know, of, of walking from my apartment to um to class. I think that's one of the things that I miss the most. I miss, you know, the feeling of a Friday when you're done with all your classes and you reward yourself with um with um a drink or you you reward yourself with like getting some food out, seeing friends. So that's what I'd say I, I'd struggle with the most. 
Yeah, I would say that like a lot of my classes quickly devolved into like being just a turn in box where I would like have assignments assigned to me and then I would work on them throughout the week and then just like turn them in or maybe not even throughout the week, like the day of and kind of turn them in. And I think actually motivating myself to watch lectures was really difficult. And I think a lot of the time I would be watching lectures afterwards and the professor, like for some reason, it always felt like they would be saying so much more than they usually said in like the amount of time they were given. And so I would constantly be pausing like within like three minutes, like pausing and writing down notes and pausing and writing down notes. And it became like a five hour long endeavor to like watch one lecture because I just really wanted to like understand it the first time, which in a real like physics lecture scenario would never actually happen. Like, I feel like I come out of most of my lectures very confused and like, that's kind of part of the learning process, but it just changes so much when you have the opportunity to pause. And so it just became like really overwhelming trying to get through those lectures every single week. Yes, I agree. Um, the two biggest challenges I faced is motivation and setting boundaries. Uh, motivation because you're in your room, you're in your room as your desk, your bed, like, you wake up to work, eat, and repeat. Like, <laughs> um, it's really hard to just have energy to participate um, and just go at it. Like, at least when we were in person, like you get ready and you walk to class. And even though at the moment I was like, oh, it's so far, like, but no, I wish <laughs> I wish I could go back. Um, but um, setting boundaries with family, like uh, I've learned to, I need to put like signs on the door, like, for my nephew, green means, okay, you could come in, red, like, do not come in, even though it's hard sometimes for him to listen. Um, but also with myself, like, I'll be eating lunch, and I'm like, oh, let me get a reading in. But no, like, I've learned that I need to, like, put that aside. Um, but yeah, those, those are the two big ones for me. I feel for me, definitely, like, like mental wise and like the motivation is a big challenge for me because I choose geology for my college degree because I really like going outdoors and like hanging out with people in the field, talking with professors, you know, looking at rocks, but I can't do any of those in online setting. And at the beginning of last year, I was really lo like low spirited because I, I think like, a year ago in the spring semester I lost like a total of like um 10 days of field in the semester and like I was like purposefully scheduling all the field classes in the spring to go outside you know and it just didn't happen and it really made me rethink like why I'm choosing geology like am I still like interested in all those courses when like the lab and the field part portion is not happening um and yeah and i took uh i took genesis of rocks uh, in the pandemic and till this day i cannot be very confident saying to my friends hey i can't identify this rock because um halfway through i was switched to online and i never actually know how to identify a metamorphic rock um and i also took the field class online uh, although I looked uh, at all the videos of professor like going to the field telling us how to use a compass but like I still feel there's something lacking and like I, I feel in my heart if I would have the opportunity to retake those classes I would because I just feel there's so much lacking for me and I am such a visual and hands-on learner and I, I feel I passed the exams but there are just things that is outside of the exam that like it is like something lacking for me yeah thank you um in case you're wondering a lot of these challenges also ring true if you're a graduate student uh, i can verify that <laughs> um, i think it's very interesting to hear challenges from the field in a field course um, I myself taught a lab course last semester for general chemistry, um, and these are some things that I, I had in my mind while I was teaching, but I, I'd love to hear more from our panelists, um, specifically lab courses, if there were any unique challenges regarding uh, teaching a lab course under remote instruction, if anyone has any thoughts about that.
I had no labs, only like uh, only labs within classes, like coding labs, which I don't really consider them like field or you know actual what you think of as labs. So I'm gonna stay out of the question. Yeah, I would say so. I took like the capstone lab course for physics um, online, and it was basically just a lot of data analysis. And at one point, we watched like someone perform an experiment for like seven hours where they asked us questions about what they were doing and we responded and it was weirdly like stressful. And also I would probably say that like in terms of the entire class, like I didn't learn anything new because in a lab class, the new stuff that you're learning isn't necessarily the content. Like you already know a lot of the content. It's that like physical like measurement that you're doing or like dealing with like the weird stuff that happens in like you know, weird noise that comes up by like someone walking by with a watch on or something, right? And so like that kind of experience like would have been very useful. And it's just, I mean, it just feels like I never did that. And I feel like that's gonna translate. I'm going to graduate school next fall. And like, I feel like that's definitely gonna translate where like, they're gonna be like, oh, can you just use this oscilloscope? And I'll be like, well, technically I can, but technically I can't. And it'll be like a very, I don't know, just a very difficult situation. And I think that feeling of like, wow, like I really actually don't know this where like, I do feel often where that I don't know things, but like now it's like, I literally do not know this. Like I never actually physically did this. And so I think that'll add like in addition, like a lot of imposter syndrome as well. Like when I go into graduate school. Um, Anthony, I just wanted to piggyback on this conversation um, where it is um, in alignment with a few questions that we have coming in. I'm curious to know for those of you, um, and Susanna, you, you mentioned this a little bit, um, for those of you that have been involved with research or sort of a, a, a project that intentionally uh, or initially would have been um, more hands-on in nature, uh, for those of you that have been um, working on projects that have been transitioned to virtual or um, sort of um, remote format. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience has been? I know we're focused on courses, but I know that for a lot of folks, you know, their research and their coursework um, are really uh, tied together very tightly. Yeah, um, I didn't do any lab or field courses, so I can't speak on that. But for research, um, through the Europe program, it has been an incredible experience, truly. Um, I've learned a lot from the professor's research and just um, really building that community with peers and graduate students. I think the one thing that I really appreciate from the uh, program is that um, they are pr um, predominantly people of color that I'm working with. And just to see people that look like me, that talk like me, um, and this thing called research, like, whoa, like it, it feels so incredible. And I'm truly grateful for that. Um, and I big shout out to them. I really, I really love the program. I feel for me, I'm kind of lucky because uh, at the, uh, in last summer when like everything is remote, um, my summer is pretty boring. I don't have anything to do. So I, I asked myself, what if like I come up with a research project to do, you know, um, so at, at least I can entertain myself a little bit. Um, so I, I contacted the professors I really like before pandemic and pitched several ideas to them and start to develop my senior thesis. And I, um, so my thesis uh, is on like looking at the deglaciation history at Yosemite. And one thing that I need to do is I need to collect rocks from Yosemite and like further process them in some labs at Berkeley and then send, out, send them out to other labs. Um, I, I feel I'm lucky because I I took like the uh, rock classes, um, the field classes, but they're all online. So I a lot of times like ask myself, how can I apply those knowledge to like this one little opportunity I created for myself? Um, so when I go into Yosemite, I challenge myself to use the Brunton compass and like I look at rocks trying to identify different minerals. Like those are outside of like my thesis but like whenever like even just like hiking around Berkeley Hills I will ask myself like what are the things that I learned into class and I feel is lacking that I can like practice right now and even like just looking at rock materials that I collected when I was a kid you know uh, things like that I I I feel like a lot of times um, before pandemic 
when people tell me about labs, I would be like, yeah, I stayed in Macomb like the entire night looking at rocks. But I feel really now, um, I feel it's, um, I'm kind of forced to find those things around me that make sense, um, that can connect to the lab and help myself to learn. Because if I don't uh, ask myself those questions to the things around me, I just like cannot compensate for the things I lost in the lab. Um, yeah, and honestly, I feel for research, it's less impacted than, um, than courses because uh, for research, I only do things on my own and I already gained some skills to operate those machines before the pandemic. So I just get permission to go into labs and um, like I'm still going there and I'm still like getting permits to go to Yosemite to collect rocks and doing all those things. And I even feel sometimes um, because I'm so used to Zoom and emailing people, I feel more comfortable like reaching out to labs outside of Berkeley, asking them, hey, can you process a sample with me? Or like, I have this question regarding your paper, can you answer? Or like, can we schedule a Zoom call to talk about it? Yeah. Yeah, I think something that like resonates a lot with me is like, I think that I'm not like a physics major because like I love like learning statistical mechanics and taking exams on statistical mechanics. Like I'm a physics major because I think the research in physics is just so exciting. And I've been doing research in condensed matter. So like the study of materials um, and especially, especially like quantum scale condensed matter. So looking at like the quantum behavior of materials, um, which is really exciting for like microelectronic applications and like all of like I don't know, kind of like transforming the way that like we interface with technology. Um, like, yeah, and so I think it's super exciting and I've been doing it for almost three years now, um, mostly experimental stuff. So a lot of like in the lab stuff, which I was able to, because I've been doing it for so long, I've been able to continue it on campus throughout COVID. And that's been really nice. And like, again, like my lab is like a big part of like my community, I guess, like is something that I don't realize as often, but like the professor, um, the professors I've worked worked with through lab have been like really incredible mentors to me. The graduate students have been great mentors. Um, and then most recently, I actually started a computational project. Um, and I never really thought that I would be capable of being like a more like theoretical or like computational physicist. Like that was just not something that I thought that I would like. And like, because I was forced into it, like I found out that that is something that like I'm super excited by. And I never had the confidence to really go into it. And like, it's just been like a really cool opportunity kind of like pairing both sides of like computational and experimental research. And like, it's actually been like probably the best thing that's come out of the pandemic for me personally, like my, the, advan the advances I've made in research. Back when I was an undergrad last spring, I was very active in undergraduate research myself. Um, but because of the pandemic, that all got shut down and I was never able to finish my project before I graduated uh, with my chemistry degree. But along the way, my research advisor was very supportive and he happened to be the faculty who was teaching a course that I was taking that semester. And he was also very supportive in kind of that switch over. So speaking of which, kind of like to ask our panelists now for our next question. Uh, what kind of, can we talk about a bit about the support and communications from the GSI and faculties uh, in your courses uh, under remote instruction? So Anthony, are you hoping that the panelists will focus on um, communication like during course time, outside of course time, or is it um, like, do you have something in particular in mind? Let's say during course time. Mm -hmm. Sorry for not making that clear. No, not at all. Yeah, so can you repeat? I, I got a little lost. So, sorry. Uh, so I guess I'd like to ask you all about the type of support uh, in your courses from the GSI and faculty that they offer to you uh, during remote instruction to help you uh, 
in these courses? Yeah, so like I mentioned in the upper division um, electrical engineering class that I had, um, the TAs, there was a lot of them. Um, and not only that, they were also really willing to help. So we had the homework parties on top of office hours, on top of um, discussion sections. So the GSIs really put in um, overtime and they helped us a lot, uh, to be honest. On the other hand, um, my math classes are more kind of 30 people uh, instead of instead of say like two, 300 in a lecture. So those are mostly run by one, like they're like a one man team or one woman. Um, but they also have a kind of grading GSI who helps them grade. Um, so it's harder for them to really spend so much time on us and spend a lot of um, like give us different opportunities because it's only one person. But he did host office hours and I went to them a few times and then felt a bit of imposter syndrome since the students there just seemed to know so much compared to me. Like in my head, I was like, oh, I thought these were office hours, not like let's have a math talk type of thing. Um, so that was that was a little frustrating, but I know that the professor was really there to kind of help people and ask them my question, uh, went in and out. Um, so I did feel supported, even though office hours always seem to me like a bit of a drag, because my my experience with office hours are not is not the best. Um, my freshman year, I took I, when I took calculus, um, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna try this office hours thing. Uh, my teachers in high school said to go to them. Um, people, the professors always promoting them. So I'm gonna give it a try. I go to Evans. Evans is a math building at UC Berkeley. I go to the 10, 10th story where this professor's office was. And I get in the elevator, get out of the, the moment I get out of the elevator, I see his office, a good 10, 20 people in that little room. And there's people outside waiting with their little notes out, their little problems. And right as I came out of the elevator, I went right back in before it went down <laughs> um, because I was like, you know what? It's, you know, <laughs> this is gonna be an hour of me wasting my time trying to get an a, a question answered. Um, but that was probably, I, I, I also do realize that that's probably the wrong way to look at office hours. Um, chances are that other students had solved the problem that I was struggling with. So I could have asked them, but I think I was also just really shy, felt imposter syndrome went back down and I was like, uh, okay, maybe office hours aren't the best idea for me. Um, but that's my, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I would say, so I personally deal a lot with anxiety. Like it gets pretty bad sometimes and it like really prevents me from being productive in my schoolwork. Um, and so for a while I would kind of just email professors and just be like, hey, um, like I can turn this in tomorrow morning um, I have it done, but I'm just like too anxious and overwhelmed to like get it in. Um, can I have an extension? And I think that um, some professors would be like, okay, yeah, that's fine. And other professors wouldn't. And I think in general for like accommodations during COVID, it really has become like this professor is willing to accommodate and this professor isn't even for the same situation. And some professors believe you, some professors don't really care about your situation. And so after a while, like I decided probably in like the 10th week of the semester to enroll in DSP. And that has like just normalized every like professor's reaction because there are like very clear standards for those professors, like for like professors dealing with students who have DSP standing. Um, so that, that made everything a lot better. And like, I never really even utilized the resources too much, like maybe once or twice before the semester ended. But the fact that like, I knew that those standards were there and I knew that this, the professors had to advocate for me because like they were legally obligated um, just made everything a lot easier and less stressful for me. Um, Susanna, just for our audience, um, some of who may not be um, familiar with the DSP program, um, I'm curious to know if you can just mention something about you know, when you reached out to DSP, what sort of support they offered you or what you know about the communication. Yeah, uh, so DSP is the Disabled Students Program, and I'm not super familiar with with it just because I became enrolled in it like seven weeks before graduating. So yeah, like, no, I don't absolutely. know like the specifics as much, but like I was assigned with like a kind of 
a representative mm -hmm. who spoke to me about like my needs as a student, like what kind of problems I was dealing with. One of the things I was dealing with was like, I had this one class that had a super intense late penalty and I kept turning things in like seven hours late just mm -hmm. because of like that anxiety of like turning things in. And especially because each of the projects was worth so much of the grade, I would just be like, it's not ready. I can't turn it in, even though it often was. Um, and so they were able to grant me like a 24 hour extension. Mm -hmm. um, and that was super, super helpful. Um, and yeah, I think that like, depending on the needs of the student, I think that like, um, they're really open to talking to you about like kind of what mental health challenges you're dealing with and like what kind of solutions um, people can come and come up with within the classroom. And they communicate those expectations to your professor and then the professor is expected to follow through. Right. Um, but yeah. I, think, um, I really appreciate that you're um, sharing this. Um, I'm hoping that you know, other students, it may just raise awareness about the fact that that is a resource that they can make use of. And it's not that mm -hmm. there's anything wrong with you. It's just that you needed access to more resources than, and tools than you had available initially. And so I'm really um, happy just to hear that it was overall a positive experience. And it did sound like it also just clarified what is possible, what's not possible. And it sounds like you were just heard in that um, in that conversation that you had with the team. Yeah, real quickly, like, I just think that a lot of the things that I was like given accommodations for, like, are just things that a lot of students at Berkeley are dealing with. And a lot of students um, don't have like the access to information or the privilege to really understand what they're, that what they're dealing with might be generalized anxiety or just like episodes of anxiety. Um, and so like, that knowledge is definitely something that I had the privilege of having access to. Like the fact that DSP existed um, was like a privilege to even know. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe making, you know, standards, just like like very like low level standards for professors on like, believe your students when they tell you something, like just assume no matter what, like they're telling the truth and don't mm -hmm. be skeptical. Um, those kinds of expectations for all professors, uh, independent of like the actual students, would be nice too. Yeah, yeah I I agree, and I think um you know I just want to say that like a lot of people um you know my group and my research team is is looking at how COVID has impacted students and you know professionals during this time, and I do want to say that I think that mental health and supporting people more across the board should be a part of this conversation. It, and it shouldn't be like when someone's having an emergency, then someone steps in, right? Just right off the bat, we need to realize that people are coming from different perspectives. We have pe people messaging me in the chat. It's so great to hear from these totally different points of view, even though you're all students. And so I just want to put that out there that um, I'm really happy that this is a part of our conversation today. And it's going to help everyone, right? It's not just going to help a small subset of people. So um, thanks for sharing about that. And I'm glad that we um, were able to bring that up. And Anthony, I'm going to be quiet and turn it back over to you. <laughs> Did anyone else like to talk about the type of support and communication that they received from faculty and GSIs? Yes, I did want to add a little bit. Um, so definitely echo what Susana said about professors being more understanding. Um, I had an incident where my friend and I were taking the same course last semester, a climate change class. And unfortunately, a cousin of hers uh, passed away and she asked for an extension on a homework, um, you know, still trying to do her homework, trying to be a student. And the professor did not accommodate. Um, he said, you know, it's not worth that much. Um, so don't worry about it. And I don't think that was the appropriate answer to give her. Um, she's in a time of like need, she's in pain. Um, so I just wish the professor would have been more compassionate and more understanding and at least give her like a day <laughs> more to turn it in. Um, but that, that has been like a, a bad incident. But other than that, I've had um, really good understanding GSIs and professors, um, allowing more excused absences and extensions. So I really appreciate that. So thank you to y'all. I feel for me, uh, communication wise, the small things professors and GSI do really like make a difference in like 
how I feel in the class. Like, um, even if it's not relevant to me, for example, like the daylight saving thing, because a lot of people in my class are from like outside of the US, the professor just sent out an email and say, hey, daylight saving is happening, turn your clock, you know, and other things like professors in class asking people, hey, are we good um, for a break here? And like, I invite everybody to like do several stretches, you know, and other small things like the GSI will send out a survey to people at like in the middle of the semester asking how he is doing uh, in organizing those uh, sessions and um, what are people's thoughts. And I feel like sometimes um, they're like really small, but also they make me feel that like we are communicating and they care how we feel in the class and they really want to listen uh, our ideas for the class. Um, and I feel um, sometimes instructors may be kind of rigid and not want to do so because um, they are like, like they are leading the class and a lot of times it's hard for them to open up to, especially if the class is larger, but I feel like those really make a difference to for people who are taking the lessons. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, I kind of like to ask, uh, how have like other figures that are important to you as a student, uh, like research mentors, academic advisors, your friends, counselors, how have they uh, supported you during the uh, the pandemic? Yeah, so I could I could uh, go first. So first things first, um, how I met Lolly in the first place is. Um, She's uh, kind of my supervisor, um, but I don't really see her as a supervisor because she's so friendly, as you all can see. Um, so the way, so the way that, for example, Lolly has supported me is by checking in from time to time with me, uh, messaging me, telling me that I'm important, and these messages really go a long way um, because she does them at the randomest times. Um, so I could be uh, having dinner, watching a YouTube video, kind of, you know, not really having the time of my life. And I'll see this message and I'm like, you know, uh, like there's somebody thinking about me, um, I do matter. And another thing is um, knowing how to um, talk to people, especially if you're their supervisor, um, because I'm sure we've all been in jobs where we're micromanaged or where, where we have to clock in, we have to always do X, Y, Z when, we're, when you're clocked in. Um, so making sure that you trust your um, your the people that are kind of under you and having respect for them, I think is huge. Another thing is um, really random things. So right now I'm doing my, my credentialing process and I have my um, mentor teacher and um, spring break is coming up and she's like, Julio, because you've been helping me grade and you know we're going through this, um, even if you don't want to, I'm gonna take you out to lunch. And I'm like, oh, you know, like, thanks a lot. Um, and so I think it, it, it really does come down to the little things and um, how you talk to people um, and how you, how you manage yourself around those people that will really make a difference. Um, Lolly could have been very like, oh, Julio, I need this task done. Um, get it to me in 30 minutes. Uh, meanwhile, maybe, you know, maybe I'm uh, in Southern California dealing with something with my parents. Um, so it's a matter of taking taking um, taking into account everybody's living situations, everybody's lives, and um, also their their mental health and their just physical well being as a whole um, when talking with them. Um, yeah, I think for me, like the biggest sense of like compassion and like um community that I felt like was from my research group um like after George Floyd's death I think that I got a lot of support from people around me um and like pretty much everyone like I knew was doing some sort of activism um to advocate for Black Lives Matter and I think that that felt it was a difficult time but I think that like people's willingness to listen to me and like um, sense of compassion was just really strong and I really appreciated it during that time. And I think that like, that like mentorship that like my PI and my research group 
had like it, it made like a super big impact and it's like continued to resonate um, throughout the year. Yeah, mentors are amazing. Um, I really appreciate the check-ins, um, even though I don't reach out as much. I feel the pandemic has made me more introverted. So then when I see emails or text messages from my mentors, I truly appreciate it because it's it's like they didn't forget about me. Like I still matter. Um, so it encourages me to like reach out to them. Um, and for example, uh, a quick shout out to Professor Vanessa Duhan. Uh, she is also on the CEO forum and um, like I didn't reach out to her and she she continuously like continues to reach out to me and I truly appreciate it and uh, because of her I'm on the panel so <laughs> thank you. I feel um, I, I feel for me um, just like maintaining relationships uh, even after things change because pandemic is so long. And one of my research mentors, she was a postdoc at Berkeley and now she's a professor somewhere else. And like, I feel just like continuing, like communicating to those who like you were pretty close with no matter like um, things change into your life, it's really important. And honestly, I feel the biggest support I got from um, faculties and staff is them letting me know that um, a lot of times it's okay to set priorities to things and it is okay for me to realize that different people learn things differently because I feel a big thing like especially now we're so long into the pandemic um, a lot of faculties and staff member has discovered so many tools for people to learn. They provide so many resources for a class, like there will be class recordings, lecture slide, readings, related videos on YouTube, and like, et cetera, et cetera. There's, it, it is actually pretty overwhelming. And um, I feel it took me a long time to realize that it is not possible for me to do all of those things. It is not possible for me to go through every slide, go through every videos. Um, and it is reaffirming to hear from them to tell me to choose whatever speaks to me and to choose whatever I can learn the material. And I feel a lot, a lot of times on Zoom because it is like just me sitting in this room staring at the screen it's oftentimes for me um, hard to realize how much is on my plate and like really sitting down with a mentor to like talk to them about like, hey, I really feel it's busy recently. I don't know why, but there's just so many things going on in my life and hearing them telling me that, hey, like, what do you think is your priority? Is it this class or that class? And are you like doing um, clubs and like which are your priorities which one do you think you should focus more on for this week or for next week you know setting those small goals and like like I feel those things people know but like hearing them from the professor or from a staff member is different than students telling themselves thank you uh, my next question uh, now that we had a full semester of remote learning, I, I like to ask, uh, do you feel aligned with your expectations for these courses? Do you feel that you've been able to uh, learn the main content or skills from your classes during uh, distance learning? I think this is yes and no. Um... Again, because I'm, uh, I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm a teaching, I'm, I'm in the process of teaching and, and all that. I often think about just the different ways and the, 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 t the learning variabilities of all students, including myself. Um, so even though for me, I think, I think that online and in person, um, I would do similar simply because I think that, um, my time studying would probably be the same. Um, I don't try to do too much, even though I'm always at home. I try to basically have the routine where if we were in person, I would do X, Y, Z. Kind of like how when you're in elementary school and you miss class, 
you're like, oh, it, it, it's it's 12 p.m. I'm, I should be at lunch right now. And then you have your lunch at home. Um, so that's kind of how I do my things. But I um, this is only speaking for myself. Um, I definitely know a lot of people who don't learn through through um, through online. You could try you could try having a whiteboard. You could try having an iPad. You could have physical objects, but those it, it will. It, but it is harder for those people to learn. Additionally, there's people who learn visually. Um, for example, if you if you're in a math class and you need to see a graph, you most likely need to see the graph, and then you need to make your um, kind of decisions about it. On the other hand, you have people that are that are better learners through an, analytic methods and through kind of getting into the nitty gritty of the math instead of seeing a graph, for example. So even though for me it was the same, I definitely feel that um, learning variabilities have um, elongated through, through, the, through, the, through the pandemic. And um, I think kind of the gaps in knowledge in people have also um, increased. So this is also something to um, think about. Yeah, I think personally, I don't think that I've learned everything that I would like to know. Um, and I definitely think that once I decide on a grad school, I'm going to like crack open every single book that they require and just like kind of skim them and read them. Um, one, because I think it'll be exciting. And two, because I think that like I should like prepare myself a little bit um, in terms of like what I need to know for my courses. I feel that I've been able to learn the content, but I don't know if I've been able to enjoy it. Um, like sometimes I'm like, oh, this is cool, but I have no one to tell that to. <laughs> Whereas in person, I'd be studying with friends and I'm like, oh my God, like look at this study. Or like, did you know this? And um, I'd feel like a genius, like sharing my knowledge, but now it's not the same because <laughs> there's no one to like share that with. Um, but yeah it's just i'm learning it but i don't know if i'm really like connecting with it anymore i feel i'm definitely learning things but it's like different because the focus is so different for all the classes like again take the field class for example um i feel if like before pandemic, if you were asking me, hey, what do you expect to get out of this field class? I would definitely say like, oh, like I'll be strong hiking mountains every weekend and I can identify all those rocks. But now like you ask me, hey, what did you get out of that field class? I would say, well, I like get out of a lot of like making maps and looking at the data and inferring stuff and reading papers. I feel it's just different skill set, but it's like different expectations and like, yeah, I, I feel like every day I'm still learning new things and I'm still pretty happy about it, but it's just the focus is really different than what I was expecting. Okay, thank you to our panelists. I'll pass it over to Layla. Um, thank you, Anthony. Um, we have a few um, questions from the audience that um, are actually somewhat related to some of the questions that um, Anthony and I were going to ask you. So a few people have asked um, about, based on what you've experienced or um, perhaps even things that you've heard other students um, that you're friends with uh, talk about, are there um, particular online tools that you've either seen uh, or experience, had experience with that have done a good job of making you feel connected or have enhanced your learning or ways that people have used things like Zoom in uh, really productive ways? Or just what do you think if you were sort of redesigning a class, right? Knowing how it has been on um, from the student perspective, like how can we leverage the tools that we have if we have to have online classes to make you feel like you're more a part of the class, you're more connected with the subject, um, or just to, you know, support your learning overall. Yeah, so something, uh, two, two things for me. Uh, the first one is B courses. Um, B courses is basically how instructors give us, um, give us um, assignments and then we turn them in through that platform. Um, there's professors and instructors who have um, a really well laid out B courses, and there's professors and instructors who don't. 
And I think this could make or, make or break your, your experience in that class. Um, so for example, I have um, my math instructor now, he's really good. He, on his, on his module section, he splits everything up into weeks. So week one, you have this lecture and this lecture. Week two, you have these lectures that you're responsible for and you have weekly homework. So it's a really strict set schedule that helps give kind of um, structure to my day and to my weeks. Um, on the other hand, there's instructors who have um, everything in their file section. It's not laid out correctly. You don't know what paper they're asking you to read. Um, so I think that having a, a well laid out B course as a well laid out um, plan for your class is really huge. Um, and another thing that I would say that I've, that I've personally been experimenting with as a teacher is making everybody co-hosts. And now I know what you're thinking, that's crazy. You know, <laughs> yeah, like people are gonna name themselves something else. They're gonna name other people, blah, blah, blah. But I've actually found that students are really mature with the power that comes with being co-hosts and they, they kind of feel like, oh, I have some power in my hands. Um, but I make people co-hosts because when I create breakout rooms, people can go in and out of breakout rooms um, with their friends, with um, X, Y, Z. And so something that I've also experimented with is creating random breakout rooms, making one of the people um, co-hosts and having that person work as a spy, where if they don't understand a problem, they can go to a different breakout room, work as a spy, get some intel, some information, then go back to their group um, to kind of relay this information. And so that's, uh, so making other, making everybody co-host is something that sounds insane, but in my opinion has really brought out more social um, aspects of the class where students have, are having more conversations, not only about math, but also just about college acceptances. It's that time of, that time of the year right now. And college acceptances, what's going on in class, what's going on outside of class. And I found this to be very helpful for their own community building and their own social, uh, their social skills that they may be think that they're lacking, but they're actually not. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment um, that it sounds like a lot of your um, ideas here, you're actually giving autonomy and independence and power, right, uh, back to the students and allowing the students to really, um, you know, be responsible with that. Um, and I think that that's, of course, we you know, we talk about this a lot in science education, that information flows both way, right? ways, right? We learn from our teachers who are designated as teachers and GSIs like Anthony, but we also know that we learn from our students. So in that way, um, that's what it's reminding me of um, what you're talking about. Um, okay, other, other thoughts from other panelists? Um, I have a quick one, uh, but I, I didn't want to, like, if other people want to speak. But one thing it's like super, super helpful for me is like those collaborative whiteboards. Um, because when, for example, I am in a breakout room with several people. And one thing I remember really like made me feel this is so great is um, the professor created a whiteboard for each breakout room and we can like mark things on a map and answer questions collaboratively on one, like the same screen. And I feel like, I don't know, I, I just feel like sometimes in Zoom only one person can speak and it's really easy for people to take up space for other people. And those collaborative whiteboard allows everyone to express what they're thinking at the same time. And usually it can be like visual and you can draw things on things. It's just a different experience. Even like, I sometimes even feel like when we are back in person, I wish those things can exist, you know? Like in a lecture, professor is pointing something on his PowerPoint and student can just draw on it saying, hey, I don't understand why this thing is here, you know? And other times in my um, research meetings, the professor will be presenting like a, a, a paper and he will just be sharing the paper. And because Zoom has the whiteboard thing that people can annotate, um, I find it really helpful for everybody to just go on and annotate like, hey, I think this sentence is really good. Or like on this graph, this dot like really caught my attention. And I've like, sometimes I was thinking, hey, this did not happen before pandemic. And I really wish like this thing can keep going because it's so great. I was going to add that um, I really love when professors 
use outside resources um, like Jamboard, Flipgrid, uh, Word Clouds. It's a great alternative to like the conventional uh, discussion posts. Like for example, on B courses, like there's a discussion question and students just like reply. But on Flipgrid, like students can make a video and reply that way. So that kind of also creates community because you're seeing like your classmates actual faces and like responding. So um, those are great resources. And then I think it'd be cool to kind of have like themed classes. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but like um, at least like once a month or like uh, for like the virtual background, like, oh, for this class, bring in this background and could just kind of like share a little bit and breakout rooms. Like I really appreciate the icebreakers too. Um, I've also noticed that some professors uh, have music on during Berkeley time. So that's pretty cool too. Um, yeah, another thing I would say is like, I think that the way that grading works traditionally where like you're kind of graded against, maybe often like against your peers or like graded on how well you take an exam or do a problem set. Um, I think that like doesn't leave a lot of room for growth, especially during um, COVID. And I think that grading more on mastery where like you kind of have like a group of people like working on a problem set in a breakout room and like kind of like evolving and learning off that problem set, maybe like an organized like three hour session of like active learning with your peers and kind of just like the fact that you were there and the fact that you've written stuff down and the fact that you've contributed, like I think it shows more to like, like actually shows more that you've learned than like, you know, taking an exam where like you just read the textbook the night before <laughs> me all the time and like doing fine because like you just have learned how to do fine in those like, I don't know, like I feel like now it's like a lot more about like, how do I beat this exam to get that grade versus like, how do I actually learn the material? And I think that that's like kind of just the way that courses are structured as of now. Mm -hmm. um, Susanna, your uh, answer gets me very nicely into my last question. And Anthony, I'm going to have you answer it um, because you're also, um, you know, doing distance learning as a student as well, even though you're um, you're in uh, your graduate studies. I know Susanna has uh, graduated recently. Um, so what I wanted to ask for our last question, um, and this definitely comes from the audience and also from our initial thoughts about this. So in thinking about the experiences that you had, attending school remotely, interacting with people remotely. Um, are there any things that you've sort of learned about yourself um, now that we've done a lot of things remotely, virtual learning, interacting with people, um, collaborating on projects? Um, what have you learned about yourself that makes you perhaps more or less interested in um, certain workplace environments or more or less interested in different academic or career goals or yeah, just I guess how has it impacted you with respect to what you want to do um, moving forward in the future or the type of environment that you think you would uh, be happy and thrive in? Yeah, so I think I saw this question also earlier. So I or someone commented it. So I was already thinking about it. Um, and the thing that it taught me is that I like my alone space. Um, and so even <laughs> even with my girlfriend she she she's always like oh um like I could leave you for four hours and you won't complain like you know like do you actually like me and I'm like well it's not bad it's just um I like having my alone space I like um I like doing things on my own time so this is something my roommate was also telling me he's like who I noticed you don't do much of anything like in the afternoons but you know once it comes to like 10 p.m slash midnight you to really get cracking down on work and I'm like well I mean that's just how I work um, and so I think I really learned how I work and where I work well in. I really like talking to people, which is something that I realized as well. Um, teaching has a lot of talking with people, so which is why I'm doing it. Um, but also I think there's a weird kind of flip side of it where um, many people now might look at, at a regular nine to five as something bad, like, oh, you're gonna be bored in a cubicle. But coming from immigrant parents where immigrant parents are often um, standing in their jobs um, for a long period of time, they're older. Um, as the child of an immigrant, I definitely see the nine to five job as a huge privilege. Um, 
even though it might necessarily not be for me. I know that there's like a slander against nine to five jobs, but I think in the eyes of an immigrant, the nine to five job is ideal and has a lot of benefits. So I think um, it's one of those things where, where once again, you don't have to listen to people, but um, make the decision for what works best for you and what you think would be best for yourself uh, longevity wise. So no burnout, um, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think the pandemic uh, gave me a lot of time um, to really like think about like who I am and like what I wanna do. Um, whereas like before I was just kind of like churning out problem sets and like working on physics and doing research all the time. I was like suddenly given like this like time of reflection and with graduate school applications, like it was like a lot of personal reflection. And I realized that like I wanted um, like long-term to go into like research that's more like sustainability focused. And so like I'm thinking for graduate school kind of going into developing um, solar cells and like really using like that like light matter interaction physics and taking advantage of that knowledge to kind of contribute in like a new way um, that like I feel like authentically speaks to me. I think sustainability speaks to me a lot. I'm vegan. I care a lot about like um, environmental racism and like those kinds of concepts are really important to me. Um, and also I've like discovered that like I am not super interested in um, kind of like just, um, I think I'm more interested in going into like research and into academia just because I don't really want to engage in capitalism. <laughs> and so like, um, I think, I, I don't know, I just think that like, it just seems like a really cool um, atmosphere for me. And I think that academia is like a really good space to like contribute um, like with your like research, but also like with building community. And there's just a lot of activism, especially in Berkeley to advocate for students and like for like the Bay Area and like the world at large. And I think that there's like just so much impact um, that can be done. And so like, I'm super excited about like that career trajectory. And I think that like, yeah, I could say more, but yeah. I think um, I have two things that I've learned uh, one is that I always thought I, I wanted to be a teacher, um, work with students, uh, the little ones, <laughs> but I've learned that I'm really interested in the realm of mental health, uh, working one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, I, I really love that, like getting getting to know their feelings and being empathetic, being compassionate. I feel like a lot of us need that right now, so I'm definitely heading towards that, that direction. Um, and another thing is uh, that students are resilient. Um, we've been able to like survive this pandemic, a uh, balanced home life, uh, personal lives, and it's a lot. And and I applaud all the students. Like it's really difficult, um, but but we could do it. I realized we are about to reach one thirty, so I will try to make this short. Um, one thing I learned about myself is before pandemic, I actually always brand myself as a listener. Like when people ask me, hey, how do you work in a team? I would be like, I'm the listener, you know, because I never speak up. Um, <laughs> and I feel uh, after being on Zoom, like there's one thing is like popcorn. So like people always like popcorn around and you have to speak. And actually, I learned that I'm pretty bad listener. And I am like a better speaker than I thought I am because I when like I am occupying the channel, I can just speak and speak forever. And uh, a lot of times people will say, hey, I don't think you are that great listener because I just said something and you never mentioned that you appreciate what I said. And I realized, yeah, I always bred myself as a listener because I don't speak that much. Um, so that's something I learned. And another thing is uh, one, like I didn't even thought about this problem, but ever since pandemic, I've been thinking about accessibility of education and science because I realized if I can watch those lectures from home, then other people can as well, you know? And like before, like, especially for geoscience, we do a lot of field work and it's uh, very physically challenging. You have to be strong to climb those hills and like to carry all those rocks every day, but it's not for everyone. And like, 
especially taking the virtual field class made me rethink how we can introduce those things to people maybe with disabilities or people who are far away from these regions who might not have the financial capability of buying those gears to go outdoors and like those new topics come to me and I find it really exciting. And even after pandemic, I feel I will keep exploring these topics and actually will think about it. Yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, I think what I learned or what I realized the most about myself uh, as a student and as an instructor uh, under the pandemic is that despite being a little bit of an introvert, I kind of do like having people around me to like interact with and to work with. Um, I touched on this earlier. I was really, really active in undergraduate research and my education when I was a undergrad student. I was very routine heavy. Uh, I, func I functioned, I was very productive very well when I had a you know set routine working with this person on this experiment or going to this class at this time. And under the pandemic, there's all of a sudden a lot of flexibility in our schedules, a lot of vol volatility. Um, and one thing that's kind of been challenging for me is kind of just like adjusting to that. Um, like, oh, wait, you mean I, I don't have to go to class right now? Like I can just watch it later? Oh, but well, well, then what do I do now then during this time? So like that stuff was kind of like my brain was struggling to like process it because it was, it was so used to just working always having a task to do essentially like on site or going traveling from one location to another. Um, and as an instructor, uh, you know, I always worked with a lab group of people, other like-minded people in STEM. Um, so it was easy to talk to them and to work with them. But uh, when I was an instructor and I was trying to teach my, my young students, um, I definitely felt that disconnect. And I felt like even though I enjoyed teaching a lot, and I really found out I really liked it. I feel like mutually it would have been a lot more enjoyable. There would have been a lot more out of it uh, if I actually had the students in the room with me and got the chance to interact with them on a one-to-one -one level. Um, but when I was an undergrad, I didn't. I never really realized that about myself until I lost it. So I guess you don't know what you have until until it's gone. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much. Um, it seems like the responses to this question have led us to discover that uh, there's been a lot of self-reflection during the pandemic, and each of you shared really interesting dimensions about yourself. Um, thank you so much. I know we're at time, but I want to say thank you to Anthony for leading this discussion. Thank you to Yu Yi, Adriana, Susana, and Julio. Thank you so, so much for trusting us with your amazing stories. Um, you inspire us, and I hope everything goes well. You know, uh, Kate and I are here for you now. We are part of our community, and let us know if you need anything. Thanks so much for the audience, um, for your patience, and for your attention, for sending in great stories and, um, stories and questions. And Kate, anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? Um, wow, I, I just want to make this available to everybody in higher education who works with students in many capacities. And maybe we can do that, distill some of the best ideas from this. And, you know, we won't put you on the spot, but it'll be, you know, maybe something like these were the panelists and these were some of the really outstanding ideas for, for advancing student engagement, belonging, and really taking charge of one's own education. I mean, there's just such a rich amount of information here. So thank you so much to all of you for making this happen. Um, I am very grateful that I was able to participate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Thanks so much for all of our panelists and um, our audience. And we will uh, be in touch about sharing the recording on our YouTube channel. Thanks, everyone.